Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's Clinical Labs Automation and Informatics Digital Forum event. My name is Mary Beth Didana, and I'll be moderating this discussion. The needs of today's clinical labs are rapidly changing, presenting a challenge to keep up with the latest information and techniques. Today's Clinical Labs Virtual Symposium will help fill that need with in-depth digital presentations from key thought leaders. Welcome to this session, No More Faxing, Embracing Innovation and Automation to Improve Lab Efficiency. This presentation will highlight how automating manual tasks reshapes laboratory efficiency, generating higher profit margins, improving competitive position, and most importantly, providing accurate clinical data for optimized patient care. Please send us your questions or comments throughout this presentation. Our speakers will address them during the Q&A session following their presentation. If we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to our speakers and they may be able to respond to you directly if possible. Please also see the handouts tab on the right-hand side of your screen for supporting information about this event from our sponsor, as well as information about the special clinical track at the 2024 mm -hmm. Leadership Summit in Denver, Colorado. You will also find information on our next digital forum on December 6th on the topic of cancer and genomics, as well as information about free registration for all of today's Clinical Labs digital forums in 2024. I'd like to remind you that the recording of this webinar will be available for free on-demand viewing after the conclusion of this event. And I would also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Symmetric. Their support allows today's Clinical Lab to offer these webinars free of charge to our readers. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this presentation. Gregory A. Stein is a serial entrepreneur and healthcare regulation expert with more than 30 years experience in corporate, nonprofit, and local, state, and federal governments. He brings diverse experience and a vast network of industry expertise to his role at Shadowbox. Most recently, Greg was Vice President of Strategic and Community Affairs with Millennium Health. He helped grow the company from a small startup to over 1,500 employees and $1.8 billion in enterprise value. Before Millennium, he served in numerous leadership roles, such as CFO of a startup in the defense and action sports space, EVP of a political economics division of the macroeconomic firm founded by Dr. Arthur Laffer, the world-renowned economist, VP of a startup in a sell-side investment bank, and CEO of a startup consortium of defense contractors delivering software at the U.S. Air Force and Navy. Greg began his career as a legislative aide on Capitol Hill, helping to craft legislation related to technology, energy, biotech, telecommunications, defense, transportation, and tax issues. Ryan Schneider, with a rich tapestry of over 15 years in healthcare IT, seamlessly intertwines technological expertise with the nuanced healthcare workflows, particularly making a distinctive impact within laboratory environments. Amassing extensive experience from working in healthcare IT alongside national healthcare insurance providers, Ryan, as the CEO and co-founder of TrueMed IT, has been a beacon of transformation in over 145 lab client environments. His strategic and insightful approach ensures IT solutions not merely align, but actively enhance and streamline their unique operational frameworks. The TrueMed LIS platform, birthed under his leadership, doesn't just automate, but revolutionizes lab processes, effortlessly mitigating standard workflow challenges and heralding an area of operational efficiency. Ryan stands out not solely for the strategic leadership, but found profoundly for his unwavering drive to innovate and his steadfast commitment to entwining technological advancements with pragmatic, impactful healthcare solutions. Greg and Brian, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary Beth, and, and thanks to the entire team at today's Clinical Lab and your sponsor, Symmetric, for the opportunity to present to your readership and for helping coordinate and organize the webinar. And thanks to all of you who are participating today. We know your time is valuable, and we will do our utmost over the course of the discussion to be engaging and to engage you with the goal of providing real value and ideas to take back to your lab in exchange for the investment of your time. So this is our agenda for today. So let me go through it a little really quickly. We'll start by giving a little color and context to the introduction that Mary Beth provided. We'll dig into the challenges of faxing and the manual processes that result from it, why labs are still struggling with these challenges. And then I'll turn the floor over to my colleague, Brian, here to provide a perspective of a lab information systems company. We'll share ideas about uh, opportunities for your lab to automate, and we'll, of course, leave time for audience Q&A. This is meant to be interactive. So as Mary Beth said, if you have questions, please send them over in the Q&A section in the webinar, and we'll do everything we can to answer those questions. We also have a couple of poll questions, and don't worry if it's not like a pop quiz or anything, but we want to engage you. We want your thoughts as we move through this conversation. All right, so 
Uh, beyond the introductions, uh, we want to give you a sense of why this background is relevant to the experience and give you comfort in knowing that you're connecting with people that have walked in the same shoes that you are walking in, have understanding of healthcare, lab, and software, and that will most likely be able to answer most of the questions that you throw away. So, Brian, why don't we start with you? Absolutely, yes. Thank you all, as, uh, as mentioned in the introduction. Uh, appreciate you all joining this uh, this presentation. Um, I've been intimately involved in over 145 laboratories uh, in their setup, uh, the managing this setup from a conversion to an LIS that was digitally um, uh, forward thinking and just helping promote and push the technology forward. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And the context here and the passion with which I bring to this conversation today and this topic is directly related to my experience while I was a VP of Millennium. And that was that challenge of the extreme difficulty of enabling our clinician customers to efficiently order labs and receive results. And for the labs that were providing those services to be able to return actionable clinical reports and support treatment decisions. And then of course, to get paid for those services. Um, okay, now that we've told you a little bit about ourselves, it's time for our first poll. So what we'd like you to do is to tell us a little bit about you. And this will help us get a little bit more insight as to who's listening and participating, and we can try and tailor our comments to the, acti to the activities and roles that you're involved in. Um, so I'm gonna wait here for a minute before moving on to the uh, next slide so that give you a time, a uh, chance for you to respond to the poll. All right, so we have a lab billing specialist who has responded so far. Great. Give it just a few more seconds. All right, so what, uh, what I'm seeing here is that we have a number of folks that operate in a variety of different roles throughout the laboratory, which is great. So we will speak to folks, uh, you know, interest in billing and, and interest in operations, especially interest in the, uh, the running of the lab and the systems in the lab and the managing of the lab. There is an assessor here. We'll talk to accessioning um, and so on. So uh, whereas our comments uh, will be tailored uh, as best we can to the people that are here, if there's anything that we miss or you'd like to dig deeper, please uh, feel free to add it into the Q&A section so we can dig deeper into any of these specific items. Okay, let's move on. So the problem of faxes. At the lab I worked at, we had thousands of faxes coming in every month. I mean, I couldn't believe that this was standard practice in 2009. I had previously worked in government, as we've described, and our fax machine at our office was covered in dust. How could it be possible that healthcare was so far behind? Sadly, I was recently in a conversation with a very large lab who told me that they are still receiving 7,000 faxes a day in 2023. Clearly the challenge has not gone away in the intervening 14 plus years. So clearly this is an issue. And, uh, and so before I jump into what we see as the problems with faxing and its challenges, it's already time for poll number two. So let's open up poll number two and let's see what you think are some of the big challenges and issues related to receiving faxes and all the resulting manual workflows. All right, well, we are waiting for some of those to go forward. Um, I'm actually gonna jump into the next slide and we will move forward. And then I will comment if there are, or Brian, I can comment on any of the answers as they come in. Faxes are outdated, yes, indeed. Okay, so here's the problem of faxes. According to research, news reports, our own experience, faxes and, and quite frankly, really all paper orders are continuing to be a problem. 10% of the faxes that come in are missing clinical data. How can a laboratory perform a, a lab test and provide an accurate clinical result if you don't have clinical data? Fully 20% of 
require the practice, I'm sorry, the lab to reach out back to the practice to try and get additional information of one sort or another. And then fully 25% of orders that come in have something missing that may or may not be clinical. So if you think about that lab I told you about, receiving 7,000 faxes a day, that's a minimum of 1,400 phone calls to practices, taking an average of 10 minutes each. I'm just sort of imagining here, you've got to be placed on hold, you're leaving voicemails, you're getting callbacks. That's over 200 person hours a day, 30 people making phone calls every 10 minutes for eight hours straight, just to fix what's wrong with what's coming in the door at the first shot. That's at least $5,000 a day in FTE costs just to get the order correct. Brian, before I move on, is there anything you'd like to add before we move on to the slide? Absolutely. There are a lot of responses related to the big issues of faxes and manual processing. And I do see uh, that, they're, that they're time consuming and there's no traceability all the way to um, maintenance and organization of data. But one piece popped out, which was the HIPAA concerns. Um, the reason we still use faxes is the irony is that it's also because of HIPAA, because it is one of the uh, approved or recommended paths to getting results and orders in and out. Um, between two systems, but it also is the the reason why we are still on faxes today. So it, that is a, a great uh, call by whoever put that answer in there. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. So we did some analysis. And I'm not going to dig into all the details here. If you'd like to know more about the, the details, there is a blog on our website you can check out that goes through each of these and discusses what we estimate to be the cost for each. But we assume or understand that it is a minimum of $30 to the lab for every order that comes in the door, $30. So if you go back to that lab with the 7,000 faxes a day, they're burning over $200,000 across the entire workflow as a result of accessing those, those, those orders. Now, they're a large lab. They, maybe your lab has fewer faxes coming in, but when you add in reimbursement pressure, rising labor costs, the inability to hire and, and fulfill roles, the clinic's expectations in terms of turnaround time, it really is brings the question forward, and that is, can you afford to have any faxes coming in at all? And I think the answer is no. So why are clinics still using a fax machine? The, I'm not going to do a poll on this one. I've kind of done that, that bit for you, but I'm going to move on and just jump right into it. Number one reason that clinics still use faxes is because labs let them. I mean, think about it. Sales rep is in a practice, has only a few minutes to sell the system. They get a, okay, fine, we'll try your lab. Do you think they then wanna then jump into a conversation about automation, a subject for which they may or may not be pretty well trained or even equipped to handle? No, they hand the office staff a stack of order forms, give them a rundown on how to fill it out, and they are on to the next sale. I mean, I get it highly competitive out there. A lot of lab tests are commoditized and there's no friction in the sale. You just need to get those specimens in the door. Unfortunately, this is an incredibly costly short-term set of thinking. And I would challenge every lab to step up and train their reps on selling automation as a part of the value prop for using your lab. So number two, traditional integrations through HL7s and Fire APIs can be time consuming and costly. I won't go into the details here because I also wrote a blog that's on our website about the true cost of traditional integrations, but suffice it to say they can be expensive. However, this is a part of the industry that's finally starting to evolve. There are new technologies out there such as ours and others that are bringing down the cost and time to achieve effective electronic ordering and resulting. That plus regulatory pressures such as the information blocking rules embodied in the 21st Century Cares Act are helping lever open the HRs. So don't rule out electronic interfacing, just be strategic and be smart about how you go about it. And the third reason uh, that we mentioned here is that clinics use fax machines because the EHR application themselves can be complicated. It's not really in the EHR vendor's fault either. I mean, they can't possibly build an ideal ordering experience for every type of lab order that's out there. And they're already burning tons of dollars and time just connecting labs via HL7 and maintaining their fire APIs. So they build a generic ordering process within the EHR, and that's great for 
you know, routine testing. But when you get to incredibly complex testing, like especially genetic tests, and you add in the ever-shifting requirements that payers are, provi- are requiring in terms of uh, determining and, and supporting medical necessity, it's really complicated. It's constantly changing. And the user experience within the EHR can be very frustrating. It's far easier for a clinician to order a piece of paper, drop it in the fax, and let everyone else deal with those problems. And as Brian said, there is a fourth, and that is it's also HIPAA compliant to send a fax. All right. So let's move on. And actually, since I mentioned Brian, why don't we jump it over to Brian? Because whereas I've been talking primarily about the cost benefit of investing in automation, what underlies this and what is really most important is that faxes can lead to poor clinical results as well. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let you tell me when to move on slide by slide. Perfect, thank you. Now, each of these bullet points, each of these items, these are actually seen in real time with the various clients that we've worked with as a company over the years. Um, we've worked with companies where, from a data entry standpoint, we were, even, we were able to help them reduce their, their costs, but also increase their client satisfaction because the turnaround times were, um, were improved. But obviously, when it comes to the faxes themselves, that definitely does rela- uh, create a reduced delay in patient care in getting the results back to the provider because of that extended turnaround time. And unfortunately, as mentioned previously, with the percentages of faxes that have incomplete clinical data, if you think about real world reports, let's say, for example, a toxicology test or even a pharmacogenomics test that doesn't include the medications that the patient is taking, those reports, those static reports are now going to have information that's unfortunately left out and not as useful to the the ordering physician. If a a toxicology report is missing medication information the patient is currently taking, you will have inaccurate results because of what is uh, what is seen or not seen within the patient's um, system. And when it comes to the handwritten information, as we all know, handwritten information can be illegible. Uh, I think uh, people on this this presentation would know that providers, ordering providers are, are notorious for having information or signatures or handwriting that is illegible, which is gonna cause delays, delays in processing, delays in payment, claims denials. Um, you know, Every single claims denial, as you all are well aware, are going to add up, unfortunately. And then of course, the inaccurate test results. Now, how can this be? Well, I've seen faxes where the fax printer of the the hard copy fax that was printing it out was actually missing the right side of a page. It wasn't printing correctly. So now you're talking about information, the decimal point or some sort of value that could be reduced or could not have been seen on a fax, All all the way to even soft faxes where the soft faxes that go into a faxing software, they're not gonna necessarily be necessarily be placed into the right patient's information into their right uh, bucket for that patient within their EMR. So there could be missed or missed results or inaccurate test results for various types of patients. And of course, you know, when it comes to the miskeyed inter uh, test orders that are entered, again, it's going to it's going to increase the the failure to help answer well what is the question? What is the diagnostic question that I'm ordering this test for? Again, it's gonna it's gonna cause the the domino effect when you have miskey test and, uh, test orders, and of course the proof of clinical necessity. Most people on this call are probably well aware of the continual uh, claims denials that are coming because of proof of clinical necessity when it comes to did the doctor order it, but also is the provider reviewing the result? Did they track this inside their EMR, or are they just signing a sheet of paper? and assuming that the lab is gonna handle it. Now, again, this is becoming a growing sense of concern uh, with the laboratory leaders that we've talked to over the years, or actually over the past couple months, where this type of claim denial is gonna be growing. Um, and, and that's where the solutions need to come in uh, within, within what we're about to describe. Next slide. Awesome. So how do we, try to resolve this, right? We work on, as a technology company, changing the narrative. If you look at what is the digital inbound process, how can you 
increase and automate and expedite the operations within a lab. And also, as we've mentioned in the previous slide, reduce the risks from a healthcare standpoint, as well as from a monetary standpoint for you as the laboratory. So as mentioned previously, we help reduce uh, with providing a, an ordering facility portal and also a portal that provides the results. We helped reduce the, for one lab that we worked with, over 20% or sorry, $20,000 out of $30,000 employee cost, we reduced that cost by to $10,000 just for helping with the automation of data entry. Now, again, if you increase the scale, like Greg said earlier, with 7,000 tests coming in, just multiply that out. Now, also, when you automate the communication with your ordering physician, that's also automating between the LIS, your laboratory system, and your ordering physician. This can communicate directly to an ordering physician where you automate a notification saying, hey, we're missing a diagnosis code or we're missing insurance information for this patient. You can also, with, this, uh, with, with the digital inbound process, you can also track every single inbound order. So imagine if on Monday morning, you knew how many orders you were going to be receiving in the mail that day because you knew every single order was already sent in digitally. Now, all those specimen, you can have your staff optimized to help manage the staffing. Uh, so you don't have staff burnout, but you also have the adequate staff available to run those samples and have that proper turnaround time. And of course, when it comes to the data, it's ensuring you have the data, the complete data and the tech quality, right? You know, as a laboratory, you're doing the scientific um, and the clinical assessment and the diagnostics and following the SOPs. Now, if you had an SOP on the digital side, you're able to ensure the end-to-end -end quality of both the order coming in and, of course, the results going out. And th to that, it also talks to a, an audit trail that a payer, CMS, some sort, you know, an insurance payer, they can come in, and I have seen this happen, where they can come in and they say, I wanna see where this ordering provider placed this order. And again, going from the EMR all the way to getting the result back and ensuring that they even viewed the result, that is entire process that an LIS company of the 21st century should have in place so that when you start working with them, they have that entire audit trail so that you can help uh, steer clear of any potential clawbacks um, from ensuring that there is a clinical necessity for the ordering of those tests. All right, Greg, is there anything you'd like to add to this? No, I think you covered it very well. Thank you very much, Brian. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna jump over to the next slide. All right, so there are solutions out there, automation solutions. I want to go through and talk through uh, uh, some of them and, and Brian will talk through some as well. But let me start with, uh, with sort of Traditional integration. Now we've talked about traditional integration in terms of its challenges, but it doesn't mean that there aren't situations where that traditional integration isn't in fact the best solution. Uh, sometimes it makes really good business sense and clinical sense to establish that bi-directional or sometimes even a results only HS7 interface, as long as that results only is paired with some other form of uh, electronic ordering process. In fact, some EHRs that we work with don't have an effective or any uh, ordering electronic ordering process. And so that means that web portals, such as what uh, Brian's company provides, become very important. And so there's value there in the web portal. Uh, they can be accessed by uh, any browser at any time. There's no nothing to install. It's just a web address and the login. There's no fees to the EHR vendors to, to access a web portal. And I know all this besides working with folks like Brian is because the lab I worked at built a beautiful portal and uh, we rolled it out and we incentivized our, our sales reps to train their clinicians on ordering through the portal. And it is a much better entry point than fax or paper orders for sure. There are some challenges with web portals though, and that's the fact that you've got an EHR uh, sorry, a clinic that is now sort of scribble chairing between the EHR information and the web portal, which means that they're keystroking or cutting and pasting uh, information from one into the other. And anytime you introduce human manual workflows, you introduce the potential for errors. And so even if it's uh, uh, just a few um, you know, uh, errors 
in terms of missing a, a number on an ICD-10 code or perhaps uh, uh, switching the, the information in an insurance, uh, um, you know, an insurance, a, a patient's insurance information, it can cause challenges in terms of the downstream effects. The other part is that when you're in a workflow in a web, in a web portal, you uh, are often taking the clinician out of their standard uh, environment in the EHR, and that can be uh, distracting to them. So there are other technologies, when I get to number three here, workflow automation like ours, that bridge that gap between the EHR and the portal to create a more automated workflow and to really reduce or eliminate those keystroke errors. And this enables the clinician to remain within their EHR as they operate uh, throughout the day, uh, but then to effectively order a, um, a, a lab test and receive a result uh, through wrappers or plugins uh, that, are, that, it, that are accessing both the EHR and transferring that information electronically to the list. Um, there are some challenges with that in that you have to either install or add a, uh, a plugin. But once those installs are complete, which for us takes about five minutes, then you really have that seamless solution. So that's from the order entry perspective to get the order converted into an HL7 or an API payload to go off to the list. So let me turn it over to Brian to talk about numbers four and five. Absolutely, thank you. It's important to realize that automation obviously is not just a robotic arm within a laboratory moving a specimen from one place to another. Software automation has a world of difference that it can make within a laboratory. So imagine in the case of just an LIS, um, the LIS can become the hub for the rest of your laboratory. So automation can be a notification or an auto notification to your internal supply team to send out a new batch of supplies of toxicology cups or specimen collection kits to one of your clients or all of your clients when they hit a certain threshold of low volume that you're tracking within their facility. Automation is also when you can have uh, different workflows within the LIS itself. So if it is a session and there's an, a, an automatic hold placed on that due to a lack of information, once that information again, is, as previously mentioned, is communicated back to you through the portal, that specimen can then be moved on to the next step of processing. So if it required a prior authorization or if it required any other type of information, now your, clinic, your lab team can take that and actually move it on to the next process. Each of these steps of automation, if you think about it, it is all inclusive of what an LIS should really be because it is actually helping you more efficiently run your laboratory. And of course, when it comes to the claims and the billing side of things, as it mentions in number five to the RCM automation, imagine if you had the system that automatically, when the result was validated, would automatically send it through an API or HL7 or some sort of method to your billing platform. And your billing platform was able to have all the information that was required to bill it in a timely manner on that next day or the day of once it gets resulted. So instead of now uploading a spreadsheet at the end of each night or whatever the workflow is that you may currently use, the LIS should be intimately involved with the RCM company on a daily basis to ensure that they're getting the right claims information and that there are automated components along each step of the way so that your team can accurately and timely send out the claims. And on top of that, it's also the receiving of the information from the RCM company. Sometimes RCM software may be lacking in terms of providing you the information, but an LIS automation, a true LIS automation should be end to end of sending out and also receiving so that now you can also run the analytics from the, the vendors, from the clients, from the specimen types, from everything end to end with the data that you've been collecting through your LIS. I want to add to that, Brian, something that uh, I think is, is really valuable too, and that is there are other vendors out there that are providing services such as insurance eligibility verification or, or discovery if the insurance information isn't accurate that's coming in through the EHR. Um, and, that, and that really helps at the front end. If you're able to, at the time of order or through the, the portal, 
run an eligibility check to ensure that the information coming from the EHR is accurate. And if not, go and search for it and append the correct information, then it will dramatically help with the, the challenge of maintaining if you have a list and you have an RCM system, if the information coming into the list is accurate, you're not having to then maintain two different databases in terms of trying to chase uh, and, and update. What I mean by that is that if it's not connected, if the RCM is not connected to the list, you're not getting the information on the front end, then you have an RCM team that is chasing it, billing information. They may be updating it in the RCM system, but the next time the order comes in from that same EHR with the same missing or incorrect information, your list is getting the incorrect information and you're having to repeat work on the RCM side. And there are other services too that can come into play there. Um, think about prior authorizations where you match the CPT codes, the ICD-10 codes, and that particular patient's benefit uh, plan. And there you're able through, again, other vendors, determine if a prior authorization is required for that particular test and actually kick that prior auth off. If it's an automated prior auth, get the prior auth code in at the front end uh, and if it's a manual prior auth, you're buying yourself an extra day to actually put prior into prior authorizations. Uh, think about No Surprise Billing Act and the increasing pressure on labs to be able to provide transparency in terms of what the cost of a test is going to be to the patient. If you're able to combine all of that and provide that information through automation, you're able to present to the patient the potential cost that they might find based upon their deductible status and all the other information that's now been gathered at the front end. And you could even send that patient a link so that they can click and pay their deductible or copay before the service is rendered instead of chasing it after the fact. All of these items collectively work together to improve the experience, not just for the clinic and for the lab, but also for the patient and quite frankly, for the payers at the end of the day. Because when information goes in a, in a claim that is incomplete or incorrect, uh, it, it has been denied by the payer, even though they're going to have to go back and pay it at the end of the day once that information is collected. So collectively, it's an incredibly important thing to think about automation holistically throughout the entire life cycle of the conversation. All right, Brian, on to your next slide here. Awesome. Thank you. So this goes into how do I do this? What do I do? How do I think about the strategy of this? And this is a snapshot where if you were to work with a, a forward-thinking LAF company, uh, a company like Shadowbox from the ordering standpoint, the, the implementation shouldn't be a six-month or a 12-month timeline, right? It should be a very automated, even internally within the companies, an automated process that focuses on the next steps from going to the identification all the way to the go-live process. And what I mean by that is you should identify in the very beginning, what are the things that you're changing? What are the things you're cutting over, whether it's a full LAS cutover or an implementation of, of a shadow box like ordering platform with your current LAS? Each of those components, you wanna have your entire team ready to go to identify what is the end goal that we're trying to reach. And then within that, it's really up to the vendors such as ourselves to help analyze, well, how are we going to get there? What are the steps? What are the, how are we going to determine the different configurations needed? And what does that even look like on what that task or those configuration timelines will look like? Then we get into the scheduling and then of course the implementation. Now implementation could be anywhere from somebody coming on site to help with the implementation. A lot of days we don't really see that obviously during the COVID times, um, there was a lot of virtual uh, implementations that had happened. And because of the cloud-based technologies these days, the majority of implementations that we do, um, and I believe also on the Shadowbox side, those are remote, but it still has those dedicated team members that go in and help deploy and help configure to the needs of each individual client. And of course, the testing. Now, the testing can be extended beyond the eight to 10 weeks, depending on what your needs are. If you're testing and you're a laboratory that's working on the FDA regulation, um, you're doing tests for medications or for some other uh, FDA regulated purpose, testing may be extended due to the GXP processes and documentation and validations that need to be in place. But for the standard clinical lab, the test should take between one to two weeks to get that end-to-end -end workflow tested out. 
And then of course, training, right? So you want your team to be trained, very well trained, whether it's the lab technician or the A sessioner or the billing person that may or may not be interacting directly with your system. The training is incredibly important so that whether it's a video training and on-site training or standard user guide trainings, ensure that your team has the training needed so that when you do go live, that you are ready and prepared and they have all the answers ready. And of course, with the go live, there will still need to be handholding with your LIS vendor or your, your ordering provider vendor for the handholding, right? Ensure that they're all talking at the same time to this, you know, even if it's a daily stand-up call, making sure that you have the things needed to ensure that you can go live and have as few hiccups as possible. Again, this is this is the, our standard implementation in, in conjunction working with Shadowbox directly. Um, the, this is what a standard implementation will look like for us. Others will vary, but again, it shouldn't be a six or a 12 month timeline. It should be a very dedicated process and it should be a very identifiable process along the, along the steps when you do choose or select that next vendor. So I recommend when you go through those discussions and you are looking at a new um, implementation for a, a, an entity like Shadowbox or an LIS like TrueMed, ensure that you ask those questions to those vendors. What does an implementation look like? What is the strategy behind it? How do you go about that? And if they can present this type of information, that's another checkbox that they know what they're doing and that, that it's, you know, they've been doing this time and time again. Yeah, Brian, I want to add a point or two on, on top of this. And the first is just to reiterate how important it is uh, that the lab be thoughtful about training. And so uh, training is not just within the lab itself, but also training with the uh, with the sales reps and the other. Uh, if you have if you have a, a, a collectors or phlebotomists, enabling them to really understand the need for having the clinic in, input information electronically uh, at the time of order to ensure that they are providing the right information for the patient at the right time, and really reducing. The, the time it takes for a clinic, the disruption in a clinic when labs are having to make phone calls or send other information or use other means to, to get uh, and chase that information that doesn't come in on the front end. So I wanted to just, number one, uh, really uh, 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 reiterate how important that training is, and it's not just within the lab, it's throughout the organization. And then the second item I want to uh, say, and that is that you know, we have a great relationship between our two companies because we've worked on a number of implementations mm -hmm. together. And I think that that's an important factor for you as well when you're selecting your vendor suite because there are no silver bullets. There, it takes a tool belt worth of, you know, of different means of addressing the various challenges that are out there. And so understanding if your vendors work well together and are willing to support each other and are willing to participate collaboratively in an implementation process, and not just after you know once implemented and that go live, but are really willing to work with you and collaboratively, collaboratively with each other throughout the lifetime of the engagement. There are always going to be changes that need to be made. There are always going to be hiccups and challenges and, and so on. And having your vendors uh, collaboratively engage with you as the partner in the process uh, will dramatically reduce the the friction of maintaining and con constantly improving and supporting your automation solutions. So those are two key issues I just wanted to add. Anything else, Brian, before I move on? Uh, just one bit about what you just mentioned about how everything will be changing. You know, these are, we are not doing lab testing like was done 15, 20 years ago of just the blood and, and toxicology and chemistry. You know, we have genetics, we have new genetic tests and assays that are released on a daily basis. And so you are absolutely right. You need to have the team that is capable to adapt and be flexible and the product to adapt and be flexible with the changing times within the laboratory environment. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, so we're gonna wrap up our, our prepared conversation uh, here on this slide. Um, and really, we discussed the, um, the cost and operations and most importantly, as we described, is the clinical challenges generated by fax machines and essentially manual processes as a whole. And we've discussed why uh, labs are still using fax and some of the automation options that are out there for labs to consider 
We've shared that there's no silver bullet and that there are various solutions that combined become an effective means of addressing these challenges. And we've discussed how important it is to be able to implement in a short period of time so that your ROI becomes evident very quickly. And the all-in automation should be considered and implemented wherever possible throughout the life cycle of that clinic, patient, lab, payer workflow. And as you can see on this slide, it drives clinical value. It improves uh, your service with your clinician customers. It results in far fewer errors, which is so important in terms of uh, good patient outcomes, actionable data coming from the lab results, dealing with ensuring that when you get a CAP or CLIA or COLA uh, review that you are, 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 are passing, um, and really just helps with clear communication across all of your vendor suite, uh, across your internal operations, your external players, such as your sales reps and clinical support teams, as well as the clinicians themselves, and ultimately lowering the risk. Uh, of, um, not just from the audit, but potential for lawsuits and other things in this highly, highly regulated environment that we're all operating in. Brian, anything else you'd like to add before we open up the floor to questions? No, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with this. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to reiterate that uh, each of these items, you know, there are absolute benefits uh, to, to the digital uh, forward thinking process. And I, I recommend everybody look into it and continue to push um, push their laboratory into the forefront of, of this process. Um, let's let's make the the laboratory technology space. Let's make it the the let's put it into the 21st century. Great, Brian. Appreciate that. Okay, Mary Beth, uh, do we have some questions? Okay, great. Thanks very much, Greg and Brian, for a wonderful presentation. So we're now about ready to move into the question and answer portion of this webinar. So a reminder that you can submit your questions and comments by typing them into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. So even if you don't have a question, please uh, leave us a message. Let us know how you enjoyed this presentation, if you found the information useful, and if you'd like to see similar content from today's clinical lab in the future. Another reminder to please visit the handouts tab on the right-hand side of your screen for supporting information for this event as well as information about future free virtual events from today's clinical lab. Um, we did have a fourth poll, Greg and Brian. I don't know if you'd like me to launch that now for the audience to consider while they think of some of their questions. Sure. Absolutely. I don't. I missed the poll in my, in my Q&A here. Sorry about that. That's okay. We have um, a third poll asking about experience previously when implementing a new digitization project, and then we just launched a fourth multiple choice poll. So we'll wait for some... Uh, for some of those results to come in. And uh, maybe you'd like to leave your contact information here. That way, if people don't have a question right now, um, they can uh, call you or email you or scan those QR codes for a way to get in touch with you after this webinar is over. Um, so in the meantime, let's go right to these questions that are already coming in. Uh, the first question says, when considering ways to enhance digitization, digitization, excuse me, what criteria differentiate a technology forward LIS vendor from one that is not as innovative from the perspective of an LIS vendor? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, it, it really goes into not just the show and tell of the product. Um, yes, you can get a demo and you can see the enhancements or the changes or <clears throat> the features and functionality, but it goes to how does that company accept feedback? How do they take in that feedback and how do they make the changes? What do the, the feature requests look like? What does that process look like? Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you know, during the beginning of COVID, for example, you had a lot of clients that said, well, you want we want to have a QR code that can uh, a driver can, you know, somebody can drive up. Right. And so you can take that feedback and instantly or implement it as quick as possible. And so what does that time frame timeline look like? We at, at TrueMed, we're an agile shop which means that from a development standpoint, we will take in the information and then do the development and deployment in a very rapid succession. So that can be a two to three week deployment um, for a new feature request. Um, so again, the feedback and feature request process is imperative for you to ask and understand how an LIS company is going to help you continue moving your lab forward from a technology standpoint. And you could even ask, let me see your roadmap. What kind of roadmap, what kind of technology, and what kind of plans are you planning on building over the coming years? Because the the marriage between a, a laboratory and a, 
and an LIS company, you know, the ideal is that it is a long term relationship, right? So that you want to know, well, where are you pushing? Where are you going to get your, you know, your your next um, or how are you going to build your next batch of features and what kind of input as a client will I get to provide to that? All right, great. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's, let's move on to our next question. We are struggling to hire people and replace positions right now. What do you guesstimate we can save through digitization? Uh, let, let me take that. So first of all, I feel for you. Uh, I understand what it's like out there uh, enabling and the, the ability to identify qualified uh, staff that have uh, both the, the background experience and the uh, and the, the the wherewithal to handle the very highly challenging environment that is a lab, clinical laboratory today. Um, you know, we we saw through through COVID uh, just a massive uh, hiring and firing cycle as the various waves came through, and so it is challenging to have people that come in that are able to accomplish what you need and. I was just recently working with a, a lab that uh, is still receiving about 15,000 faxes uh, or paper orders over the course of a month. And we assessed that if they were able to move just 10% of those over to electronic ordering and connect connectivity into the limb systems that uh, working with companies like the two that are here today and others can provide, that it would save them about $300,000 a month. Um, so that's just 1,500 of those 15,000 orders uh, being uh, converted over to electronics, uh, electronic ordering and resulting, saving them $300,000 across the course of, the, of that month. So a very significant return on investment in a very short period of time. As Brian said, if you have an effective team working together, you can be up and running with that initial implementation in six months. Uh, I'm sorry, in three months, not six months, not 12 months. And, uh, and so then uh, once you're up and running with a, a fully automated process, you're now returning your payback period on that is, is days, weeks, or even you know, just a month or two. Okay, great, thank you. We have another question that says, you talk about the challenges of fax and paper orders, but what can we do about it if the referring docs refuse to automate? Uh, it's a great question, and fortunately, over time, it's a it's a it's a challenge that will hopefully go away as the digital uh, digital generation moves into these positions, and and they, they they are more comfortable in in navigating through the um, through the, the the electronic processing of of orders, results, and quite frankly, um, everything that they do in their lives. Uh, but the, the, the way that, that we've seen our customers be most effective when a clinician says, look, I just like paper, is to present them with the challenges that they will see in their office as a result of using paper, starting by the poor clinical report in terms of the value of the report when a paper order is made and telling them that you know, it isn't in your interest as a lab to provide a service for them that is going to cost money for their patients um, if, they're, if you're not able to return a result that's clinically accurate because the order wasn't uh, legible or complete or was soiled in transit or what have you. Um, the, the second thing I would say is that in is to talk with the office manager themselves and say, look, how much time is your staff spending being interrupted in everything that you have them doing every day in a busy office to answer the phone or to, 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 to deal with a sales rep that's coming in and collecting information and, and uh, you know, having to print things out and fax them and so on after the fact. Uh, so it's not just about the clinical value. It's also about the operational value in the, in the clinic itself and why that's valuable. And then the third thing is show them how easy it is to order electronically from some of the new technologies like ours and others that are out there to show them that um, it is as simple as ordering on paper. In fact, it's even faster. And, and, and we have found that when the sales rep is armed with this type of uh, confidence, with these types of talking points, with the ability to easily demonstrate the value and the ease of use and the user experience, 
that we're able to convert even the most reluctant of clinicians over from paper. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. This one says, in the context of healthcare digitization, what are some key considerations for ensuring data security and compliance and how can an LIS vendor assist in this regard? That's a, that's a great, great question. So um, of course, you know, HIPAA comes in uh, to play when it comes to ensuring patient safety, patient security. Um, so an LIS vendor depends on what type of uh, LIS implementation. So if you have a software that is installed in your laboratory on a server, that is going to be a different type of implementation than uh, a software that is run in the cloud. And when I mean the cloud, that's going to be a, a one of the big, you know, three Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Azure Web Server, or Amazon or um, Google Cloud. And they, uh, those companies spend billions of dollars every year on security, just baseline security, where, you know, if you have a software installed on a server within your laboratory, you know, from a, a competition from the, the security aspect, you know, you are, would be much less of a target, but I have heard more and more clients, um, not clients, but more and more laboratories having ransomware attacks on their servers and essentially having to pay out, unfortunately, which that just becomes a whole nightmare, right? So from a consideration standpoint, the, the cloud, yes, it may be a um, new, uh, you know, it's somewhat scary to some people, but there are, constant updates uh, to the cloud from a security perspective compared to what a an, an in the closet type server may have that's not that's not um, the case for everybody but that is a, a very real scenario that you need to to think about um, and then of course ensuring data security and compliance from an, you know compliance from a backup and an audit trail um, the cloud provides, uh, wonders of capabilities for that to happen and to happen efficiently and in a cost-effective uh, method. It's interesting, Brian, you mentioned that uh, back in the day when I ran a defense consortium, we actually operated a SCIF, which is a secure compliant information facility. Um, and uh, we had our servers behind locked doors, key codes, cameras, everything that went into protecting those on-premise facilities and, and, and equipment uh, from a security compliance standpoint, is an added cost that uh, that most labs uh, and others in the healthcare space, in the defense space, they had to do it. That was the rule. But in the lab space, with technologies like yours and others that are out there, uh, they can really reduce cost while increasing compliance and security, as you've already described. Another thing that I would just recommend is that you, know, you should, in your vendor selection, be asking security and compliance questions. And any vendor that isn't forthright or, or happy to respond with a detailed uh, response, either through demonstration of a you know, compliance audit like a SOC 2, Type 2, or what have you, or high trust, you, know, you should be concerned um, and, and, and that they are not putting their, um, your security and your compliance at the top of the list. Because for any software vendor out there in the world that we live in today, uh, it needs to be job number one. All right, great, thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. This one says, how can the adoption of electronic health records and other digital systems positively impact patient care and the overall efficiency of healthcare facilities? And what role does an LIS vendor play in this transition? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's interesting. So the, you know, again, because of COVID, it kind of put laboratory testing at the forefront of the patient's mind. And so now it's not just I want to connect to my doctor's EMR and get my uh, my lab results or m what my doctor's notes are, or check on a prescription. It's I want to have everything available in my hands so that I can make my decision or, or I can use a telehealth or I can send the results to somebody else for a second opinion. Right. So having having the capability of getting the information to the patient, that that should be the end goal, obviously, within the confines and the the you know first the reviews from an ordering provider to review those results so that there's no uh, negative patient impact um but the ehrs they they've been very good at ensuring the adoption of having the tools necessary for a patient to get those results and to get that information from their ehr pot you know partially because it is a part of requirements for ehrs to have that built in 
Um, on the LIS side, however, that's not necessarily a requirement um, from the government. That is just a nice to have. So with an LIS, it is a nice to have, but it, it, in your mind, it should be it, a, a should have or a requirement from your perspective to have the ability to ensure that, of course, no information blocking, but those results do get into the EHR so that the patient can then get those results out. Or in the case of even now we're seeing the growth of direct to consumer lab testing, ensuring that those results have a system or the LIS has a portal or a system to get those results directly to the patient as well. So the, the LIS vendor is playing a, a growing and a more vital role in ensuring, like I mentioned, the results accurately do get into the EHR, which again is where a company also like Shadowbox can help uh, expedite and facilitate the ability to do that, while at the same time, the, the growth of the direct-to-consumer market where laboratories do want to have the ability to have a purchase uh, capability from their platform as well as a result capability from their platform. And again, the, the LIS is becoming central and a key player to making those all those components happen, whether that's inside through the LIS itself or connected to other third parties like a shadow box um, it, from the LIS. Okay, great, thanks. We have time for one more question. What emerging trends and technologies in the healthcare space should healthcare providers and labs be aware of for the future to enhance digitization? This is my favorite question. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, this is what gets me up every day because uh, the opportunities that are becoming available as a result of the advancing technology uh, and the implementation of that technology are, are really groundbreaking and exciting. And I, I want to give kudos to the, the federal government, quite frankly, uh, for passing the 21st Century CARES Act, which enables um, technologies like ours and others to, uh, to have access to the marketplace in a way that wasn't possible before. Think about where we're headed in terms of AI, and I'm sure that you are seeing all sorts of different, uh, you know, headlines and things about different artificial intelligence solutions out there. Artificial intelligence in terms of improving the ability to read a pathology test to determine, you know, to get more accurate results, or using artificial intelligence to uh, more effectively ensure that um, that uh, that 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 uh, your your um, operations are, are optimized uh, using, we're still just getting into the generative AI and what that might mean in terms of providing clinical decision support um, based upon just massive data sets. There's, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity out there from a technical standpoint. And I think that the, whereas the federal government led the way in terms of a regulatory standpoint, the states are now getting on board and in many cases moving even further ahead. And some of the exciting things that I'm seeing from that perspective include states that are now mandating the inclusion of social services type information as part of the patient's complete continuum of care to ensure that if a patient in an underserved community is, is at a, a food bank or at a homeless shelter or is, um, you know, being seen at a, a in a substance abuse clinic, what have you, that that type of information is being collected effectively and brought into the system of record at the acute centers and the hospitals. So if that patient shows up in a, in a hospital in an emergency room for whatever reason, that there is more information at hand uh, to be able to more effectively treat that particular patient. I'm especially excited about where pharmacogenetics are going and genetic testing more broadly are going in terms of really driving individualized, personalized healthcare. And on that front, it's a little frustrating to see some of the regulatory and other payer type issues that are out there. And so I, that, so I think that from a lab perspective, it's important that we think about not just getting that next specimen in the door, but really the long game. What is it that, uh, that labs should be doing and thinking about to ensure that they continue to have the access to develop lab developed tests that are effective and, and have good utilization and have good clinical outcomes without being stymied by additional regulation is now being proposed. 
what should labs be doing in terms of managing the Byzantine process in the uh, from the max in terms of obtaining coverage. These are things that are, are trends that are, they may not be necessarily just technical in nature, but they're important for labs as an, as an, as an industry to remain cognizant of and involved in and not just leave it to, you know, the one or two big lab trade associations out there to hold their, to carry their water. These are very important uh, types of things that we should be thinking about as we move forward into this new age of digitization, because we don't want the regulations to stymie the ability to bring these new technologies, new tests, new solutions to market. Brian, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Nope, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, I was going to say I could talk for days on the technology and, and new things, of course, on AI. Um, but again, you know, it, looking to your vendors to help push the boundaries. Um, I have an Uber app or a Lyft app on my phone. Why can't I have that same type of app that provides a courier service or a phlebotomy um, component to your laboratory so you can provide better patient care and better provider care um, within your local lab area? Um, so, you know, that type of, type of thing is something that we just, well, shoot, let's just create that type of app and, and, and push it out, right? So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of technology that is constantly pushing, and I absolutely uh, recommend everybody on this call that you talk to, even if you have a great relationship with your LIS vendor or your, your vendors now, ask them, let's talk about roadmaps, let's talk about things that I'm seeing that I want to know, that I want to see in the future, because you are you, the laboratory, are the groups that will push uh, the technology and push the future uh, in forward. So, and, and I appreciate that you already do that today. All right, wonderful. Thanks so much. So that does bring us to the end of this webinar. And just a reminder that this webinar will be available on demand shortly following this presentation. One more reminder to please visit the handout section on the right side of your screen for more information from our sponsor information about the special clinical track at the 2024 Leadership Summit in Denver, and today's Clinical Lab's upcoming free digital forums. On behalf of today's Clinical Lab, I'd like to thank Greg Stein and Brian Schneider for all the hard work they put into this presentation, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Once again, thank you to our sponsor, Symmetric. Their support allows today's Clinical Lab to offer these webinars free of charge to our readers. Please tune in for our next presentation at 12.30 p.m. Eastern today using a cloud-based platform to speed up and streamline integration testing. For more expert insights into the latest tools and technologies for the clinical laboratory, please visit our website at clinicallab.com. We hope you can join us again. Thank you to all of you for being part of the today's Clinical Lab Digital Forum, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.